Voting is underway and has been for about half a week now and will continue to be until this Saturday is the final day of that. We've been getting the early voting totals from the clerk of the county, Tony Petrucci, an avid Notre Dame fan. Good morning, Tony. How are you, sir? Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> it feels like still, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, um, got some good results again today. Uh, yesterday we did 2,985 total voting uh, at the three locations. Beddington was 1,071, Dunn Building here 873, and Pikeside location 1041. Uh, that puts us at um, 13,492 people that's actually voted. That's not counting the absentees yet. Uh, right as of yesterday, uh, we have 1709 absentee ballots. Okay. Do you uh, do you calculate these as in who voted for whom uh, before election day, or does all that have no, to remain till election no. day? Uh, that, that's all done election day. Okay. Yeah. And that includes the absentee ballots, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, my sense is we have a very good turnout in Berkeley County. Are you seeing this through, or talking to your, your colleagues? Uh, are, you, yes. are you seeing this throughout the state? Yes, sir. Uh, just about every county, whether they be whether they be big or small counties, have have uh, been uh, going over their projection. Um, I'll just give you one um, real quick. Kanawha County, of course, she's similar to us. Uh, Miss McCormick, she does a great job up there. She's She's got nine locations on the outside. They're about 13 percent. Um, and, yeah, everybody is getting high numbers, uh, according to what I see. So um, I was thinking 20,000 would be a good number here for us uh, for the early voting uh, for those 10 days. But I'm thinking maybe we might, we might hit that 30,000 mark. I mean, we're at 13,492 right now. Uh, we still have, um, uh, two, you know, the rest of the week, except Sunday, and um, not counting the absentee ballots. So, yeah. uh, you know, it looks pretty promising. And I was down at Beddington this morning at quarter eight, and uh, there's probably 30, 40 people in line there. Larry, Delegate Larry Cump sent out an email yesterday talking about how uh, long the wait was for one of his constituents, and he said that he'd be mm -hmm. talking about adding a different uh, additional locations. You mentioned yesterday, Tony, that for the next election season, you'd like to see at least a fourth location. Well, it, it would seem that way, according to that. And if you're going to do it, uh, you, you you definitely want to do it on an off year election to make sure you can get all the bugs out. And it, and it looks like it's probably going to be if if we do it, you know, as. Uh, uh, Commissioner Stubblefield knows that, you know, it costs money with uh, your poll workers, your machines, and, um, you know, everything else that goes along with elections. But it would probably be out towards the uh, Hedgesville area, it looks like, where we're going to need something, just, do, just my opinion. Do the commissioners have yeah. to vote on that, or is that something you can they unilaterally do. do? They do. Yeah, we've got to go through a process with the Secretary of State first, and then um, the commission has to approve it. We have to put it into paper actually twice um once that we want to do it then they approve it and then after it's approved it's put in <laughs> so it's it's a process just like we had to do uh for beddington and um black side so john yeah john I, I know you don't know who people are voting for but you don't know you do know who is what the registrations are registered Republican, Democrat, mm -hmm. Independent, and mm -hmm. such. So, of the the number of votes are in there, do you have a breakdown of percentage? What party is represented the no, biggest? We, we, we wouldn't have that. Okay, we wouldn't have that right now. Uh -huh. Tony, you know, we just whoever votes votes. We wouldn't know who you know the, if they're Republican or Democrat right them at, when they vote. Yeah, Early well, the, well, we 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 would, but we, we we don't know how many and all that till till election day. Okay. Early voting hours yeah. today go until 5 o'clock? Uh, during the week, eight, uh, 8 to 5, and uh, Saturday, 9 to 5. All right. Anything else to add to that, Tony? I don't think so. I got that percentage down for Commissioner Stubblefield. That's about 14 <laughs> percent. <laughs> Tony, you are a good man indeed. <laughs> Very responsive to our request. <laughs> Thank you, Tony.
Thank you. Uh, d- uh, just for my kicks and giggles, do you want me to just to call in every day? That would be marvelous. I mean, that way you won't, we won't have to worry about anything. I'll just call in and yeah, keep, we'll go from there. Keep texting me the numbers, though. Yeah. I'll text you the numbers, and I'll just call in. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah, we if you we, want to ask me. We appreciate yeah. your very cheery voice in the morning, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it comes with a job. (laughs) (laughs) Very good, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Take care. Tony Petrucci, Berkeley County Clerk at uh, 841. If you're listening to this live, it uh, will be 441 if you're doing the replay this afternoon. We welcome in J.B. McCuskey, who is currently the auditor of the state, looking to be attorney general. J.B., good morning. Morning, fellas. I'm going to call in every day, too. (laughs) (laughs) J.B., it's always great to hear from you. Well, it's great to be heard from, and, and good morning to everybody in the Eastern Bay Handle. Yeah, Bill Stubblefield, John Gilstrap, along with me. When I told Bill you were calling in, JB, his eyes lit up. He looked like it was Christmas oh, morning, I'm too. Sure. I, I enjoy you. visiting with you, JB, very much. Well, I enjoy visiting with you guys, too. How, sounds like you guys have a lot of enthusiasm out there for the election. I'd say, yes. The early voting numbers have been very impressive so far, as, as they've been around the state and around the country, for that matter. Yeah, uh, JB, yeah you I had agree to- with that. You have to put this in context, though. During the primary, we had 17.3%. We trailed, yeah, I was going to say, your primary turnout was very low. Yeah, we, we trailed the rest of the state. The state had, I think, an average around 30 to 35%. Some, in some counties, had as much as 45 to 50 and we had 17%. So this is a real breath of fresh air with what Tony tells us every morning. Yeah, well, that's good. And, and it, you know, people need to get out and make their voice heard. I mean, they're just – it sounds trite, but it's true. I mean, we live in a country where it's easy to complain, and the only chance that you get to effectuate what you're complaining about is on Election Day. And, you know, Hoppy does his, um, his steam release, right? Uh, and, and Election Day is kind of like steam release for your politics. Yeah, ex- very much so, yeah. Except you don't get immediate gratification. Uh, <laughs> in this case, no, we not get gratification about two weeks after voting closes. So. It may be. Uh, JB, yeah. it's been a, uh, at least in the Eastern Panhandle, a fairly quiet attorney general's race, as especially compared to the primary. Do you disagree with that, or would you tend to agree? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our general elections have been a lot quieter, right? And And I think... Um, you know, we have hyper competitive primaries on the Republican side now. And what happens, and, and I think those are a good thing. Uh, I think primaries are a great way for the parties to um, find out who's battle tested and, and who who has the, the ability to, to raise the money and, and build the coalitions and, and build a campaign that can win general elections. Um, but there was, I mean, there was, I think, a little a level of exhaustion, um, not just from the candidates, but from a lot of the electorate too. Uh, you know, we, how much money was spent in the primary? Sixty, seventy million dollars, probably. When you add it all up, mm-hmm. uh, and you know that that's exhausting. There was a lot of mudslinging, a lot of TV ads, a lot of radio ads, a lot of campaigning from the governor, attorney general, senate, you name it. And um, I think people were tired. <laughs> Um, but but for the last three or four months, you know, it's been a it's been a uh, a steady sprint for us on on the campaign trail, uh, just making sure that we hit all the 55 counties and um, and we're we are building the coalitions that we need to be an effective attorney general. Uh, should I should I be uh, successful in one week from today? Can you tell us uh, the differences between you and Teresa Torreseva, your opponent, who has run before for this position? Uh, she, I don't believe she's run before for this position. Uh, what did she? Well, she ran for something. I'm confused. I'm sorry. I think Teresa ran for uh, House of Delegates in Ohio County. Oh, maybe that was it. Okay, my mistake. I knew I'd no, talked to her okay. before about her campaign about something, though. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, she's been wonderful to campaign against. Uh, she's really a lovely person who's a well-respected lawyer. But, you know, we have a, just a... a some fundamental differences in policy, right? I mean, she is a, uh, a devout Harris-Waltz um, uh, supporter, and, and I'm on the other side of that train. 
And, you know, for me, it's really about which one of these political parties um, is going to stand up for the value set that West Virginians um, have and which one of these parties is going to stand up for the economy that makes West Virginia grow. Uh, And so for me, and and I don't want to put words in her mouth, so it's difficult for me to explain the differences, but for me, um, the, the reason the attorney general's office is so important is that the attorney general is the zealous advocate for the people of West Virginia, not just against companies and corporations that come in here and want to do us harm, but against um, extreme and overreaching federal government policies that wish to do us harm. And we have to be very, very mindful that our coal and gas industry still drive the ship. And we do not live in a country where we have alternative electricity sources that can ever provide the electricity that we need now, let alone in the next 10 years when we have 5 million AI data centers coming online, we have these crazy electric vehicle mandates coming online. Uh, You know, we live in a country that the amount of electricity we're going to need and use is going to expand, not shrink. And we have a, a, a federal government that's doing its absolute darndest to remove fossil fuels from the from the fuel mix and that is a dangerous proposition not just for the economy of our country uh but for the economy and the and the livelihoods of of thousands and thousands and thousands of west virginians and because there's a trickle down effect right when you look at the the coal and, and and gas industries in west virginia it's not just the direct workers it's the families of those people that work in that industry and it's the downstream industries that um are created because of it you know i can tell you right now that procter and gamble would not have moved to this side of of the line were west virginia not an, an ideal place um for power consumption because that that site uses an astronomical amount of electricity right that's just part of of what having a, a large scale um, a large scale investment anywhere is going to do. And so we have to maintain West Virginia's ability to be uh, the premier place for uh, for investment. And I think what you've seen, and I'm talking a lot here, I apologize. I think what you've seen over the last eight years is that our our state is being looked at by companies that never would have looked at it before. And our state is being looked at by families around this country that it never would have looked at it before either. And so what, what is going to be the mission of, of, of Governor Morrissey and myself is to continue that momentum, to continue to, to make West Virginia you know, on the list, uh, the, the very top of every single corporation search when they're looking where they want to invest, but also really tackling these hard issues that West Virginia needs tackled. And that is, how do we get our education system to be more competitive with the states around us? How do we rebuild the infrastructure of our state so that every single person has access to to inexpensive uh and useful things like water and electricity and um and and internet right and then lastly and probably most importantly how do we ensure that our government is providing services to those who cannot care for themselves and and in, in many respects we're just talking about how do we fix our broken uh child care services system how do we fix our broken um, sort of group home system for people that are coming out of substance abuse treatment? Uh, and how do we ensure that the elderly in our state um, have access to, to really first-class care um, with in, in, in homes and nursing homes and places where if, if they need um, some support, those things are going to be local so their families can visit them uh, or provided at a cost that they can afford. Uh, and where everyone feels safe and, and, and comfortable with their, their, their elderly parents being cared for in, in an environment that's appropriate. So, you know, we are working very, very hard to make sure that we do that, but do it in a conservative way, in a way that doesn't blow up the state's budget, uh, and in a way that uh, all West Virginians can be proud of, and people that are looking at us from the outside say, you know what, those guys do it right. That's a place where I can feel comfortable moving my family um, my kids can go to school, and, and, and they have a government that is reactive to its citizenry and doesn't take too much away from them in taxes. J.B., I was reading some of your uh, your campaign literature, and you echoed, uh, just now echoed some stuff you've written, such as prioritizing our foster care, bridging the divide on mental health care in rural communities, uh, so forth. 
all these are very admirable. How do they fall under the purview, though, of the Attorney General? Yeah, so the Attorney General is the counsel for the executive branch. And whenever you're doing uh, a significant reorganization of any, any big group, right, be it a, a private company or the government, the CEO or the governor is always going to be the thought leader and the driver. But having a, a general counsel who would be the attorney general as a partner um, in how these reorganizations happen, how do, we, how do we use best practices, how do we ensure that you know, all of the things that require legal opinions are happening in a way that, that makes sense, are constitutional, um, and, will, and, and are designed to be successful – a CEO and a general counsel together, especially when, when they're sort of a uh, – have a, a unique uh, uh, combination of thought, right, uh, is really, really an important thing. And, and I just can't wait to, to hopefully get started with that, that kind of transition and, and to support Governor Morrissey in, in whatever ways that he, um, he sees our state needs to be reformed. And I think the general counsel in that situation is, is probably – one of the key support people in that role, and, and I'm looking forward to doing it. John Gilstrap, what's your day one priority? First one. Day one priority is to – that's a great question. I have so many of them, and I'm trying to pick one of them out. The first – the day one priority that I have is to, is to make sure that I continue to have a staff of lawyers that are on my team that are ready to defend the people of West Virginia um, in every way possible. Because the success of the Attorney General's office is not just driven by my passion for the state and, and my um, thoughtfulness in, in how we should proceed to protect people, but I need to have lawyers who are killers, who can go to the Fourth Circuit, who can go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and who can win at every single level um, because it's it's one thing to have a to, to have a plan and have an idea, and it's another thing to have the players on your team that can execute it. And so, for me, my day one priority is is making sure that I have the best law firm in West Virginia um, with the best lawyers who are ready to to win at every single level, uh, every single day. Can you attract lawyers with a flexible pay scale to do that, JB, at that level? Yes. So the that this is this is a really interesting thing. So what probably the most amazing thing that that General Morrissey has done in, in the Attorney General's office now is great constitutional lawyers from across the country see this office, the, the Attorney General's office in West Virginia, as one of the premier jobs that you can have. And the reason is is because we lead on important constitutional questions. Right? It was West Virginia versus EPA. And that case uh, has shaped the way that, that our federal bureaucracy um, can function uh, as it relates to congressional mandates forever. It's one of the most important cases of all time. And so lawyers, especially young lawyers coming out of Harvard and, and Yale and, and, and all of these incredible schools, um, look at West Virginia and they say, you know what, That's a, if what I want to be long term is a is a wildly successful constitutional lawyer. It might be the best first stop to go to West Virginia because I'm going to get opportunities to practice law in places where you can't do it anywhere else. Um, and for me, the great news is is that we don't have to always look to Harvard and Yale because we have a law school in our state, my alma mater, WVU, that while it might not always be ranked up with those places, um, produces really, really <laughs> – incredible lawyers who have a, uh, a sense of, of what West Virginia means, why it, it's important to be a lawyer. Uh, and WVU produces lawyers who understand the role of lawyers, I think probably better than any place I've seen, that, that lawyers have a special place in our society, um, and there is a duty and an ethic uh, to being a lawyer that, that requires you to not just be great at your job, uh, but to stand up for your client. Uh, because their livelihoods are on the line because of, of your performance. And so, uh, yes, the answer to your question is, is we can attract the best lawyers, and uh, we're really looking forward to, 
to, to finding a, a team of people who are, who are looking to come in and fight alongside me. Well, Jay, I'm staying on the lawyers here for a second, Bill. Will you also continue to essentially attract free agent work from attorneys who aren't directly on the state's payroll for certain cases? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. It is impossible to, to accomplish the mission of the attorney general's office without – it's called outside counsel. Um, and especially in, in some of these very intricate um, – Sort of consumer actions and, and and things of that nature, the 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 true utility of that is when you're paying lawyers, uh, you know, on a contingency basis. They, I don't have to to have enough lawyers to do all these cases at all times. I can I can pay for the work as it's getting done. Uh, instead of having to hire 200 lawyers, I can have a very core staff of people that that do. The, the very, very important work in the office, and we can work with outside counsel so that we, we don't have to, to balloon the size of the office through the roof. Yeah, J.B., uh, uh, Patrick was very successful and very aggressive in going after what was perceived as uh, federal overreach. Do you see some of these uh, same sort of issues uh, that you'll address? On, uh, do you see one or two in particular that you'll probably address? Yes, absolutely. The, the, the idea that we have a federal government that is um, attempting to expand its authority um, is, is as true today as it was when, when Patrick started 12 years ago. And when you have a, a smaller state like West Virginia, uh, they can sometimes, and, and I hope the case is, be overlooked um, in the broad uh, governmental functionality of, of, of the federal government. But I think it's actually more devious than that. Uh, I, I think that we live at a time when large metropolitan areas, be they in California or New York or D.C., um, they, don't, they don't respect the lifestyle of people that, that live in West Virginia or places like West Virginia. And they don't necessarily want to see us be successful because they want to see the entire world sort of move into this urban um, – this sort of urban – style right where nobody owns a car and everybody lives in a in a um in an apartment and and there aren't people that work with their hands and there aren't you know these these sort of you know the 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 age old the old adage right is that you know you you don't care where your food comes from until the farmer stops working right and and we have to make sure that that we live in not just a state but in a country where the, the value sets of, of more rural states are, are represented, protected, and valued. And I think that's one of the uh, incredible powers that the attorney general has in a state like West Virginia is that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the attorney general of California or West Virginia, right? We have just as much power and just as much authority to stand up for the people of West Virginia as the attorney general of California does. Uh, and that is, it's a great equalizer, and it is, uh, it's something I'm really looking forward to, to doing. And on that note, JB, we are just about out of time. Thank you so much for yours. Hey, thanks, guys. I hope everyone has a great day. Make sure you get out there and vote. Um, and, and I will not call every single day, just every other day. <laughs> if you do, I'll still answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know you will. Hey, guys, you all have a great day. Have a good one, JB. You too. See you guys. JB McCuskey.